Court documents reveal that there was no science behind the science of the travel ban. On August 13, 2021, the Canadian government announced that anyone who hadn't been vaccinated against COVID would soon be barred from planes and trains. In many cases, science deniers could no longer travel between provinces or leave the country. If you lived in Vancouver and wanted to visit your dad in, on his deathbed in Ontario or Greece, screw you, get injected, you deplorable, or resign yourself to never seeing your father again. Jennifer Little, the Director General of COVID Recovery, the secretive government panel that crafted the mandate, called it one of the strongest vaccination mandates for travelers in the world. The policy was draconian and wide sweeping, crafted by an autocratic and dictatorial prime minister, our beloved Justin Trudeau. Well, in the better late than never column, recently released court documents which capture the decision-making behind the travel mandate, indicate that far from following the science, the Prime Minister and his cabinet were focused on politics. No, say it isn't so, St. Trudeau. Two days after announcing the mandate, Trudeau called a snap election, gambling that his strongman tactics would catapult his lowly liberals into the majority. His overreach resulted in roughly 5 million unvaccinated Canadians for being barred from visiting loved ones, working, or otherwise traveling. The court documents are part of a lawsuit filed by two brave Canadian residents against the government. Until last month, they were under seal. Both plaintiffs are business owners, both have family in Britain, both have refused the vaccine on the grounds of bodily autonomy, both were reluctant to identify their businesses out of fear, fear of losing clients and customers. These fine gents are Carl Harrison, and in his affidavit, Mr. Harrison, 58, said that he and his partner, Emma, had immigrated in 2009 from Britain to Canada. He became a Canadian citizen in 2015. He has an 88-year-old 88 mother in Britain, and he was furious that for months he couldn't visit her. When you've got oppressive government behavior, he told the reporters, you are only left with one of three choices, accept it, fight it, or leave. I can't accept it. I moved my family here and I wouldn't be, I'd be letting them down if we moved away. So I'm in fight mode. The other plaintiff is Sean Rickard, whose father, also in Britain, is suffering from late stage Alzheimer's. Rickard, 55, lives in the town of Pickering outside Toronto, and he owns a small exterior siding and ease trough contracting business. He portrayed himself as something of an activist. I guess I'm the Lone Ranger, he told the reporters. When I see something wrong, evil, corrupt happen, I have to speak up. So in the fall of 2021, Rickard launched a GoFundMe to do battle with his government. In November, Harrison, who had learned of Rickard on social media, reached out to him. And in December, they jointly filed suit. Rickard and Harrison's attorney, Sam Prevolo, said that all government decisions related to public health demanded transparency. Civil servants shouldn't be able to hide behind a shroud of secrecy, Prevolo stated. The whole point of the case was to lift the shroud and cast a spotlight on the unscientific basis of the mandates. Here are some key facts that the court documents have shed light on. No one in the COVID recovery unit, including Jennifer Little, the director general, had any formal education in epidemiology, medicine, or public health. Little, who has an undergraduate degree in literature from the University of Toronto, testified there were 20 people in the unit. When Presvelos asked her whether anyone in the unit had any professional experience in public health, she said there was one person, Monique St. Laurent. According to St. Laurent's LinkedIn profile, she appears to be a civil servant who briefly worked for the public health agency in Canada. St. Laurent is not a doctor, Little said. Reached on the phone, St. Laurent confirmed that she was a member of COVID recovery. She referred all other questions to a government spokesperson. Little suggested that a senior official in the prime minister's cabinet, or possibly the prime minister himself, had ordered COVID recovery to impose the travel mandate. During cross-examination, Little told Presvelos repeatedly that discussions about the mandate had taken place at senior and very senior levels, but she refused to say who had given her team the order to impose the travel mandates. I'm not at liberty to disclose anything that is subject to cabinet confidence, she said. Wow, 
government bureaucrats. How much power, eh? The term cabinet confidence is noteworthy because it refers to the prime minister's cabinet, meaning that little could not talk about who had directed the COVID recovery unit to impose the travel mandate because someone at the very highest levels of government was apparently behind it. I'm sure it was none other than our fine prime minister. In the days leading up to the implementation of the travel mandate, transportation officials were frantically looking for a rationale for it. They came up short. That was made clear by an email exchange in the latter half of October 2021 between Aaron McCory and Don Lumley Marilia. McCory is the Associate Assistant Deputy Minister for Safety and Security in Transport Canada, the department that houses COVID recovery. Lumley Malari is an official in the Public Health Agency of Canada. In the email exchange, McCory seemed to be casting about for a credible rationale for the travel mandate. This was less than two weeks before the mandate was set to kick in. To the extent that updated data exists or that there is clear evidence of the safety benefit of vaccination on the users or other stakeholders of the transportation system, it would be helpful to assist Transport Canada supporting its measures, McCory wrote. Four days later, on October 22nd, McCory emailed Lumley Marley again. Our requirements come in on October 30th in just over a week, so need something fairly soon. On October 28th, Lumley Marley replied to McCory with a series of bullet points outlining the benefits, generally speaking, of the COVID vaccine. She did not address McCory's question about the transportation system, noting that the Public Health Agency of Canada was updating its public health considerations with regard to vaccine mandates. Two days later, on October 30th, the travel mandate took effect. Then eight and a half months later, on June 14, 2022, government officials announced that they were suspending the mandate, although they made it clear that they could bring it back in at any time. Within days, government lawyers filed a motion seeking to shut down Harrison and Ricard's suit on the grounds that it was now moot. And Presvelo said to make sure that the public never saw the court documents. Since the case was still open and court documents are unavailable to the public while cases are open, shutting it down would have sharply reduced the likelihood of anyone seeing the government's official testimony. So, on July 12th, Presvelos filed an additional damages motion, arguing that his clients had suffered damages during the mandate. Neither Harrison nor Ricard said they wanted money. The point was to make sure the suit didn't go away and the court documents were made public. Kudos, gentlemen. But even so, the inner workings of the COVID recovery unit and more generally the Trudeau government's thinking around the travel mandate remain opaque. COVID recovery has no website and it name and its name appears almost nowhere in government records. There is a brief mention of the unit in the guidance document announcing effective June 20th, the travel mandate would be suspended. The Trudeau government has claimed to follow the science on COVID, but that science is strangely different than it is everywhere else. Bruce Party, a law professor at Queen's University and a former board member at the Conservative Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms said in an email, Instead, its policies are based on spite, uh, divisiveness, and pure politics. COVID now serves as an excuse to punish the government's ideological enemies. Sort of like the truckers. Harrison and Ricard went to expose the truth behind the mandate, wanted to expose it, that it was driven by politics, not science. They believed they had a right to refuse a vaccine about which they had come to have doubts. They said they were doing this for all Canadians even those who thought they were wrong. What I have personally struggled with and have found to be the most unconscionable and objectionable aspects of how this pandemic has been managed, Ricard said in his affidavit, is the unnecessary, unnecessary hateful, vindictive, and divisive behavior that I witnessed from neighbors, friends, family members, colleagues, and our government. I would add the prime minister specifically. He didn't say that, those are my words. The words and actions of our government, which has entrenched policies based on vaccination status without reflecting the risk of those unvaccinated, is far from the warm, caring, and thoughtful Canada I remember living in. Well, sir, uh, I wish it were the case, but uh, with leaders like Mr. Trudeau, very hard to find. In September, a judge will decide whether to quash the lawsuit. 
So far, 16 government officials have testified. Even though this kind of case almost never goes anywhere, there have been several court challenges to the mandates, and all of them have been rejected. Harrison and Ricard, whether they realize it or not, have already won. They have given us all a behind-the-scenes peek at the wizard. What happens next is anybody's guess, but hopefully it will encourage others as well to stand up and be counted in this fight. I find the idea of hopelessness prevalent in Canada, Harrison stated. The idea of protesting doesn't come naturally here. There's a tendency for people to keep their head down, which I don't understand, and the government exploits that. That, sir, I do understand. Anyways, thanks for watching. I do appreciate it. Please post any comments you have in the comment section. You can also follow me on my Rumble on my Locals account, and I will see you next time.